So you've already read the title, do twice as many cores actually yield twice the performance? Well, we're going to run some CPU synthetics as well as some gaming benchmarks to test this hypothesis. So first let me run through the test bench that we'll be using to run both of these scenarios. First up we have an Intel i5-4690K overclocked to 4.6 GHz. Yes, that was as high as I could get it without seeing severe CPU temperature hikes. It was, it was a little scary once we got to 4.7. I didn't regard it as stable so we went back down to 4.6 and that's pretty much where it's going to stay from here on out. Ooh, I have Snapchat. We have an ASRock Z97 Extreme 4 LJ1150 motherboard as well as 8GB and two 4GB variants of Kingston HyperX DDR3 clocked at 1866 MHz. Now you probably expected me to have a Pentium G3258 lying around to mimic the 2-core CPU that we'll be using on our other test, but what I have done instead is use the exact same 4690K and just turned off two of those cores to mimic to an extent the G3258. So the overclock remained the same, and of course everything else in the test bench has remained the same, uh, but the, the, the difference there is going to be only two cores running at any given time versus four. So what I did first was I ran the benchmarks with all four cores running at 4.6 gigahertz apiece, and so these are the results for the synthetic CPU test that we found. First up is Cinebench, and our quad-core CPU achieved a score of 583. Now at 4.6 GHz this might seem a little low, but that's because we had a screen recorder running during the entire time that we were running both of our sets of CPU synthetic tests. So these scores are a little suppressed, they'll actually be a bit higher I think with 4.6 GHz and no screen recorder running, we achieved a score of 670. So 100 of those higher than what we achieved in this one is actually what you would yield in a CPU like this overclocked to this extent. Now, for Geekbench 3, which was the other CPU synthetic test that we ran, we achieved a single core score of 4136 and a multi-core score of 13236. Those are the CPU synthetic tests for our quad core. Now let's hop on over to our dual core and see how those scores compare to those of the quad core. If you're wondering how I was able to turn off two cores in my CPU, it's very simple. Go ahead and restart your computer, push F2 or whatever button corresponds to pushing your system into its BIOS. It depends on your motherboard. You can see your manual if you're curious about that. And then for me in particular, I had to hop on over to advanced settings. Click on the CPU tab and then change how many cores are running from four to two, or all to two in my case. It's really that simple. And then restart your computer and you're good as gold. So once booted into our operating system once again, but this time with only two cores activated, we ran both CPU synthetic tests once again with the screen recorder running. Now obviously only having a dual core in this case uh, and using the screen recorder at the same time will affect performance uh, a bit more than it would with a quad-core CPU just because you can't multitask as much with only two physical cores. So the scores are probably a little bit biased towards the quad-core in this case. However, I will show you in the Geekbench test that things weren't as skewed towards the quad-core CPU as you might expect. So first up is Cinebench. Let's go ahead and get that out of the way. It took so long for Cinebench to finish with only two of those little yellow squares rendering images at the same time. I'm serious, it probably took about three minutes for all these to run. And we're at 4.6 gigahertz here. This is what most people can get their Pentium G3258s to. Uh, and our Cinebench score overall was not very promising. We only achieved a score of 256 CP, which is a little under half of what we achieved with our quad-core CPU at 583. But let's move on to Geekbench because Geekbench is going to show us something special here. Geekbench not only measures the multi-core performance of our CPU but also the single core performance. And if our theory is true about single core performance and it being the exact same CPU, I guess it's not really a theory, it's kind of already proven, our single core score should be nearly identical. And it was. It was identical to our quad core CPU. It was close enough. Uh, it was 4040 in the dual cores case and it was 4136 in the quad cores case. So. You could argue that there are a few little minor processes in there that might require more than one core that the single core benchmark takes advantage of, but for the most part we can say that the screen recording aspect of running our CPU synthetics hasn't affected our dual core as much as we might have anticipated it to, being that it only has two cores and it's going to struggle to run multiple tasks at any given time. Now where things start to change is our multi-core scores here, so remember our quad core scored 13236 but our dual core scored 7100, so actually a little over half of what our multi-core score was for our quad-core synthetic test. So 
Yeah, you can pretty much say here that our performance was almost literally cut in half in terms of these two specific CPU synthetic tests. Next up are the gaming benchmarks. I know these are the things that you guys actually care about, so I'm not going to talk through each one of these individually like I usually do. I'm just going to show them all to you and let you guys decide which of these two CPU variants, either the G3258 Mimic or the 4690K Mimic, uh, is more ideal for what you expect to get frame per second wise out of the games that you choose to play. Here are the graphs. So obviously, the i5 won, but it's the margins by which the i5 won in three of the four cases, GTA 5 being the exclusion here, that have me second guessing the viability of an i5 for gaming. You see, if you could purchase a G3258 and overclock it to 4.6 GHz and get somewhere around what we achieve for our dual core experiences here in games, is it really worth paying any extra money? I mean, we're talking $100 to $200 of extra dough for an unlocked i5 processor when you're still getting around 60 FPS in most of these games with just the dual core. So I guess that's the question that will be left unanswered in this video. Is it really worth the extra 100 to 200 dollars? I mean, that's a lot of dough. 200 bucks is a lot of dough for a lot of people. Uh, to get an i5 when you're really only getting about 20 to 30 percent additional frame rates in most of these games. GTA 5 of course being the exception once again just because GTA 5 is very CPU intensive. The more cores you throw at GTA 5 for the most part, the more FPS you're going to get marginally. But uh, for the other games here, uh, for Dying Light, for Black Ops 3, and for Dirt Rally, pretty much any racing game you can think of, Dirt Rally is kind of a representative of all those games, is it worth the extra money? Let me know in the comments below. If you're a video editor, if you render a lot of things, or I don't know, edit photos, music, stuff like that, obviously the i5 is going to be for you, and I would prefer you to get an i5, because a dual core really isn't going to keep up as much with those processes. But if you're just a gamer, G3258, anyone? Anyone? Is it worth it? Is it not? Be sure to subscribe to us if you haven't already, like the video if you liked the benchmarks and what you saw in this video, dislike it if you didn't, and let me know what you'd like to see improved in future videos. This is Science Studio, thanks for learning with us.